So when you look at the universe on really large scales, you see that galaxies aren't distributed randomly. There are clumps of galaxies here, and there are giant voids of galaxies where there's nothing here. And so I study these clumps of galaxies called galaxy clusters. And they could have anywhere from 50 or 100 galaxies to upwards of 1,000 galaxies all in the same place, all sort of orbiting around each other. And uh, I look at each individual galaxy, and using ground and space-based telescopes, I look at how stars form in those individual galaxies and how the, the environment of these gigantic galaxy clusters affects how stars form inside the individual galaxies. Many machines require routine maintenance for optimal performance. For example, cars, you'll want to have an oil change or a tune-up every so often. And similarly, um, cells in our body require routine maintenance too. And so, in the Higgs lab, we study the mitochondrion, um, which undergoes routine maintenance when it divides from one structure into two separate structures. And what I'm really looking at and trying to determine is how one um, molecule in this process um, gets enriched at this site of division. So I work with um, a generalized version of a Fourier transform. And a Fourier transform is a really useful technique in um, signal processing. It lets us analyze signals. So you can think you have some signal coming in, maybe the sound wave of an orchestra. So an orchestra is playing and the sound wave is coming in, and you can graph that with respect to time. So, you know, maybe you have some crazy sound wave. Who knows what it looks like? And we're graphing with respect to time. And that's great. Like, we've captured the sound. Um, and at this time, it tells us exactly what that orchestra sounds like. Um, but if we want to analyze this further, maybe we want to know what instruments are being played or um, how they're being played. And the way to find that out is to analyze the frequencies of the sound wave. And what a Fourier transform allows us to do is it allows us to redraw this picture with respect to frequency instead of time. And in doing so, that gives us um, a, a way of analyzing different things about this signal, such as what instruments are being played, if it's an orchestra. Because when we know what the different frequencies are and how often they occur and how intense they are, that gives us a lot more information. So humans have a really remarkable sense of direction. I can effortlessly tell you that Baker Berry is going to be in this direction, the Connecticut River is right here in front of me, and this is this really fantastic ability that a lot of people take for granted. So I'm interested in finding, finding out what goes on in the brain that provides us with such a rich sense of direction. So what I do is I record the activity of single neurons in a rat's brain. And so I have a rat and a little electrode that allows me to record those neurons, and I have the rat moving around in kind of a maze. And what I find is if you record the activity of a single head direction cell, it will become active or fire spikes whenever the animal is facing one single direction. So that, say I'm recording one head direction cell, it's totally inactive, but when the animal is facing, say, this direction, that cell becomes really, really active. And then any other direction the animal faces, that cell is inactive. And there's thousands and thousands of these cells, such that no matter which direction the animal is facing, there will always be a subset of these head direction cells that are active. So we think that it's the activity of these head direction cells that kind of provides us with this sense of direction. And they function much like a compass. So we're interested in figuring out how the brain, how these cells are organized within the brain and the different circuits that kind of contain these head direction cells and how they ultimately give us this perceived sense of direction.